Hello and welcome to the Billion Dollar Broker Podcast. My name is Ross LeCane. I'm bringing my 25 years industry experience together with leading experts around the globe to give you the insights on how to live a better life and grow a profitable mortgage broking business that you are proud of. Today, we've got Todd Duncan. Todd Duncan is the CEO and founder of High Trust uh, based in the US and is a legend in the mortgage industry. He's worked with many sales professionals over the last 30 years. Uh, It was my privilege to be his first international guest on his podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Billion Dollar Broker Podcast. I'm excited to have the legend Todd Duncan with me today. Uh, This is the second part of uh, a podcast that we did. Uh, Todd is someone that I've followed for the last 20 years. He's a legend in the mortgage industry. He's coached over 5 million students um, throughout his career. Um, He's the founder of and CEO of High Trust. Um, We were just chatting at about an event that he'll he'll share more about. But, um, you know, it's my privilege to, uh, to, you know, to dig under your covers and sort of see what makes Todd Duncan tick. So, uh, yeah, welcome, Todd. Ross, it's good to be with you. I have uh, admired you uh, both from afar over here in the States and then every time I come to Australia, we connect and uh, very proud and honored uh, to hang out with your tribe and uh, just have a conversation about life and success. So uh, congrats on all you've achieved and uh, it's an honor to be with you. Yeah, you mentioned life and success and that's one of the things that I've really admired about you and your coaching is that you put someone's life at the forefront, don't you? It's it's sort of, it's always around a 360 degree coaching model. It's not just about performance and tactics in business. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, you know, I think the gift that we all have, Ross, is we have the gift of time, right? I mean, we didn't... Uh, we didn't decide when we were going to be born. And, and for most of us, we're not going to decide, you know, when we die. And, and so the, the inevitable question for everybody is, so what do you do to produce a meaningful life? And we've, we've believed for a long time, I think since I was 23, I became a mortgage broker when I was 23. I got my real estate license when I was 23. And, and I started a journey by understanding that there's a couple ways to, to do business. One is just to go full throttle and do it and focus on transactions. And you can make a lot of money doing that. Um, or the other way is you could go full throttle and focus on relationships and you would have an exponential factor because relationships could produce more transactions than a single transaction. So early on, it was about um, nobody really gets rewarded at, for working the most hours and nobody you know, ever receives a top producer or an award from you know, a, 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 an industry syndicate or you know, like, like, uh, uh, you know, like our friends at the advisor. You just don't ever receive a reward because you work the most hours or you work the hardest. And it's sad to see, it's sad to see a lot of life's travesties um, as, as kind of backlash or blowback from not running the, the business the right way. And so I just, I, I started from day one, how do you make as much money as you can by adding as much value as you can in as short a time as you can? And then how does that whole thing come up with a, an enjoyable life, a, a lower stress life, uh, a more you know favorable life, even a more purposeful and intentional life. And you know, we we look today at the global pandemic. We look, uh, you know, we're 12 years past the GFC, and uh, you know, we have these cycles, right? And I had a guy the other day. He's a, he's a broker. He's been he's a broker for 23 years, and he was just blowing my head up with just chat, 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 chat. And I looked at him. And I said, it doesn't sound like you've been in the business 23 years. It sounds like you've been in the business one year, 23 times. And it was just this repetition of, I haven't changed. I have, I'm, I'm good. I'm doing a lot of volume, but it's just like, oh. and I just looked at him. I said, you know, the key is not how long you've been in the business. The key is what have you accomplished and how, how does that rank as a, as a function of the life you're enjoying, you know, and people, people need to understand that if you, if you're a slave to the business, then your life is going to be marginalized. 
And if you own the business and you make the business conform to what you want in life, then life will be maximized. And I think that's the, that's the balancing act. Your life is either marginalized or maximized. So that's kind of my short take on life and success. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. And, you know, me venturing into this coaching business, I'm seeing that um, I think, you know, and I'm interested to get your thoughts on what drives that. Do you think it's, I mean, to me, what it seems like is it's it's around fear. And um, I know you talk about, you know, failure a lot and, and that sort of comes back to that fear. So what do you think are the key drivers of that in the in the people that you're sort of talking with and coaching around, so drivers, you know? The drivers what, for? The, the driver um, for, you know, being in that cycle of repetition and not focusing on, creating a life for themselves, but getting stuck in focus in the business too much rather than focusing on what's going to give them a better life. Man, you and I could spend a day on this topic. It's crazy. I think, you know, I think the first thing is, is you've got to have some level of belief that it's possible. You know, you have to have a belief, a fundamental belief that you can achieve greatness. And there's a whole history of why you may or may not believe that, right? But every step to greatness is a step in a direction that unlocks your potential and, and allows you to achieve things at a level that you hadn't previously thought. One of the guys that I studied when I was a broker uh, was a guy named Thomas Dreyer. And he said, the life that we live is the life within the limits of our own thinking. And I always felt that that was a, a, a profound comment because um, you know, if we have a $100,000 a year mindset, then we're going to be conformed to that mindset. If we have a $100,000 a month mindset, then we're going to be conformed to that mindset. If we have $100,000 a week mindset, then, you know, and you just look at the migration of mindsets. And I think what, what ends up happening is people don't give themselves permission to succeed at that level. And the other, the other problem is I don't, think, um, I don't think most of us understand the value of um, running the business. I mean, controlling the business and deciding you know, who we do business with and how we do business and really setting up our own levels of personal boundaries. And I think that's because we're not sure of the value that we bring to the interchange. I mean, if we're working with homeowners buying real estate or, uh, you know, developers buying land or, you know, people uh, discussing three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollar obligations and debts, if we don't think that we bring value to that conversation in a really superior way through, tr through trust and through study and through equipping ourselves for greatness, and all those things, then we will succumb to a business that actually the clientele runs us. And I think one of the most profound things that, that we need to understand is that um, you're either going to be run by your clients or you're going to run the business for the benefit of your clients. And there's, a, there's this kind of two-way street that if I don't decide how I want the business to be done, if I don't decide how I want to work with clients, what kind of clients I want to work with and the kinds of clients that I have that kind of connection and chemistry with, then the business will run me. I had an early mentor that said, if, and so I'm a mortgage broker, I've got, I don't know, I think my best year, I, I settled 1100 loans. And, um, and I remember a guy telling me when I was 23 years old, he said, um, if you don't have a way of doing business, you will have as many ways as you have borrowers in process. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, because if I have 50 loans or 60 loans or 80 loans in process or two, it doesn't matter what the number is. If I don't have a way to do business, mm -hmm. then the business controls me. So I think it's belief and it's how do you want to do business? And, you know, I guess a piece of advice I got early on too, so this will be the last piece is, um, there's enough people who will do business the way you want to do it to not worry about those who won't. And I think that's a big idea. I think it's a big idea to realize that most of us can make a fortune as mortgage brokers and business people. Um, if we, if we understand that I only need a certain number of clients, I don't need to be everything to everyone. And I think that's a, that's a big decision that people need to make. And so belief and belief and business perception are the two, the two big things. And then once you own that, then you own your destiny. 
Definitely. It's Craig, you know, from what I, you know, summarize, you're saying it's that belief that you can be more than, and you don't have to react to the urgent or, or the client's demands that you really need to set that vision for where you want to go and then start tacking action on that vision. But yeah. one thing you mentioned, you, you started at 23. I'm really interested to hear the, the Todd Duncan story. So you started um, when you were 23. And then, yeah, tell me yeah, what those first years were like and, um, yeah, how you sort of your career and some of the, the big milestones that you sort of had to, to come through. I know you quite well and I know you've been through a number of different challenges and setbacks in your life. So let's, let's give me, um, you know, the last sort of, sort of 40, 45 years in a, in a nutshell. Wow. <laughs> that put me at 15, I think, or, or 10, something like that. Um, so I, I, um, I, I started off and, and, uh, and I was going to be a doctor and my father was a doctor. And, uh, and so I was, uh, I was doing a, a pre-med kind of curriculum and, and I was not doing well. And, uh, you know, science wasn't my gig and, and understanding math wasn't my gig. And those are two of the, the kind of the big deals if you're going to have a pre-med kind of course of study. And uh, I remember the first year of university, um, my GPA was 1.2. I think I was just a hair away from like Fs. And, uh, and, and, uh, and it was, you know, my dad was paying, my mom and dad were paying, I don't know, $30,000 a year for out-of-state tuition because I was going to Colorado. And, um, and I remember my dad calling me one day and he said, um, he said, uh, you know, if you don't want to be a doctor, you don't have to be a doctor. And it was like, that was kind of permission, right? And my dad graduated from Stanford and he had a degree in psychology and accounting. He became an accountant. And at the age of 30, my dad decided that he wanted to be a doctor. So he had a career and then he decided to be a doctor. And he told me, I don't have to be a doctor, but you're really good in business. So why don't you come home from Colorado and you can, you know, you can look at SC, you can look at Stanford or, and I won't pay for those, but you can look at Cal State Fullerton, which was the third best business school in California. And so I went there and I graduated with a 4.0 and I graduated with honors. And so I got into my lane. So I went to a 4th of July party, which is Independence Day here. And my parents' good friends owned the largest real estate company in the Western United States. And they happened to own a mortgage company that went along with that real estate company. And so I became a mortgage lender um, two months after graduating from university. I had no idea, you know, what or how or any of that, what to do or how to do it or anything. And, but I had, I had about 2,000 real, real estate agents to call on. And I'm thinking 2,000 people to call on. I don't know that I can ever call on 2,000 people. So I started doing this, start going to their real estate offices and <clears throat> I was probably a week into it and nobody had given me a loan. Nobody had showed any remote interest whatsoever in, in doing business with me. And it was just keep making calls, keep making calls and something about like, just keep making calls and not getting anything, keep making calls. It just didn't seem like a good idea. And it wasn't very uh, motivating. You know, I mean, every night you'd go home and you go, great. I talked to a hundred people today and nobody said yes. And tomorrow I get to talk to a hundred people. And no. So I, I had enough common sense to say, maybe there's a different way. So instead of doing that for another two or three or four weeks, I called a friend of mine who owned a, his dad owned a real estate company, not one that I was working with. And I sat there for four hours one day and I counted 21 people that came into that real estate office from lending, from title, from legal, from home warranty, from all this. And not one of them did anything unique. They all look the same. And then at the end of the day, this guy came in. He's 34 years old. I didn't know it at that time. He's got a beautiful suit on. He doesn't have anything except a beautiful leather folio. He has an appointment with the top real estate agent in that brokerage, which I went on to learn later was the top real estate agent in America for this for for you know for remax which is one of the largest real estate companies in america mm -hmm. or in the world actually and um and he walked out of there with something i never seen he walked out of there by shaking this agent's hand and and he said i look forward to a long and and profitable partnership and i heard that word partnership so i called him that night i just rung him up and i and i said you don't even know me i watched you today and you had that meeting with that real estate agent at at century 21 and um I, I need mentoring. I need help. This guy 
um, agreed to sit down with me and lay out the plan. And the plan was four weeks into it, um, never make a call on anybody that isn't excited to have you make a call on them. Never go into an office or show up as a cold call, only make warm calls or hot calls. Don't ever, ever roll the dice and say, I'm just gonna show up and see what happens. And then he said, whenever you leave an appointment, try to give 10 times more than you're actually going to receive. And for me, that meant if I was going to make $1,000 alone, I'd have to give 10 times that, which would be $10,000. If I was going to make $10,000, I'd figure out how to somehow make, you know, give somebody $100,000 in, in value. And that's- I love, the, I love that. I love that. You know, like just that, the adding value, you know, like how, how great a mentality is that, that, you know, if I'm making, you know, um, $2,000 commission from a loan, I need to- you know, 10 times the value, like $20,000. It just changes the whole mentality, doesn't it? It's great. It well, so, so here's the deal. Um, uh, the, my mentor said, you need, to, you need to go from making calls equals rejection. And you need to flip that whole thing. And you need to say so much value actually reverses the call. So I don't even have to call you. If I get known for giving value, you call me. And then I have no call reluctance. And so I... I tell people all the time, call reluctance is a, is a function of your doubt, your personal doubt in the value you bring to an interchange. And so if you don't want call reluctance, if you don't want any fear in selling professionally, which is actually listening and solving more than it is selling, if you don't want any of that, then you have to be in the value business. And this is where things start to really get exciting, Ross, because if you're in the value business, you have loyalty, longevity, and a lot of referrals. If you're in the price business, the only business you have is based on price. And there's no sustainability to that in a market unless you're designing a business model about low price. And you can, you can make money either way, but I chose the value route. And I, I closed 6,000 loans in um, just shy of 12 years, and I only had seven real estate partners, seven partners referring business to me. And then I had a couple of businesses, but that, that was the turning point. Here's the other thing he told me. Mm. He taught me the 10% rule, and, and the 10% rule I learned at age 23. He said, the 10% rule is whatever you want to make, invest 10% in making it. So if I want to make $100,000 a month, I need to spend $10,000 a month. If I want to make a million dollars a year, I need to spend $100,000 a year. If I want to make $5 million a year, I got to spend $500,000. And I got that mindset. And so I went to a program on four months in the business. I went to a 13 week program on sales effectiveness and conversion and value and all that stuff. And it was $9,000. I am 24 years old. I do not have $9,000. And my dad um, told me, uh, I asked him, I said, what should I do? And he said, well, you know how I feel about credit cards, but if you think you can pay that $9,000 off in 30 days, then do it. And I said, dad, I can't. The course is 13 weeks long. And he said, so if you think you can pay that $9,000 off in four months, do it. But if you don't think you can, don't. And, um, and I went through a 13-week course on actually how to have a conversation. How, how to engage somebody, how to not sell a thing, but to connect in a way where people are attracted to wanting to do business with you. And as soon as I went through that, it went back into the marketplace. My income in the fifth month went up $21,000. $21,000 in one month because I invested $9,000 to get me to a point where I knew what the heck I was doing, right? And then it was just, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you perfect that and how do you get that to a level where it's just an automatic habit. And then as soon as that's done, man, you never have to prospect a day. And you know this, you never have to prospect a day in your life. If you take care of the customer, the customer is going to take care of you. It's straightforward. So that, those were the turning yeah. points. Yeah. And then what I did is um, uh, probably 11 years into it, I had been asked by my company about every other month, to train the new brokers. So they'd bring in 10 brokers and I'd do a two day session with them, still doing my business and everything, but I do a two day session. And then a month after that, they'd bring in another 10, I'd do a two day session. I just kept doing that. 
And a couple guys came up to me at the end of the first year and they, and they said, you know, you're, you're really good at this. And I said, what do you mean? He said, he, he showed me his W-2 in America, which is total earnings for the year, less taxes um, from the year before he met me and the year after he met me and his income went up $203,000 in a year. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm 11 years into the loan business. I've got about 5,000 loans that I've settled. And um, maybe I need to do what my dad did. Maybe I need, uh, he went to medical, decided to be a doctor at age 30, opened his medical practice when he was 40. Okay, I'm 34 years old and I've been doing loans for 11 years. And uh, I said, you know what I'm going to do what my dad did. And I sold my business to my team and had five years of cash flow from that. And I started the company right now that now has 5 million clients worldwide. Unbelievable. And so that's so- it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's th- yeah, that's a, a fantastic um, story. And, um, you know, you quite often um, talk about, uh, you know, two key things that I, I hear you talk about. And the one in the background is that high trust. And the second thing is failures. And I know yourself, you, you know, both a, a key and, and very important in your life. So which one do you want to start with? Do you want to start with talking about trust or do you want to talk about the failures first? Let me, let me, let me just lay down three real quick principles that have to do with exactly that yeah. question and we can take it from there. Mm-hmm. So here's the, the if, you, if, you, if you learned nothing from me ever for as long as you walk the planet, you need to learn this principle. And this is the first principle to success. And it is the principle that is the principle among all principles. And if you don't get this, you don't get anything else. So principle number one is everything can be improved. That's it. And if you don't have the mindset that everything can be improved, then you will not optimize the most important exchange rate that there is in business. Let me tell you what it is. The most important exchange rate is, we started off with this Ross, the gift of time, right? So the most important exchange rate is, how much time do I give for how much do I receive? Okay, how many hours do I work and how much money do I bring in? And we measure how much money you make per hour in our coaching company every two weeks. So every two weeks, we are measuring how many hours did you work? How much did you you make? And what was your hourly rate? And we trend this and we're tracking this. And I talked to a guy yesterday that's in our high end coaching program. Um, Right now, year to date through July, he's making $3,125 an hour, an hour, 6 million a year. And he's doing it because he understands everything can be improved. Everything. I mean, just everything. So you get that and you start to realize, okay, where are the areas that are um, most important to, in, to improve? If everything b- can be improved, what are the areas that need the most improvement, the quickest? And the number one thing is how much time are you spending a day in the activity that generates the number one revenue producing result. That's it. So so if you wanna be super successful and you wanna be financially free and you wanna realize that, you know, I've got this gift of time, it is accelerate the amount of time you spend doing the fewer things that produce the greatest revenue. And so in my world then, it was like the more borrowers that I can meet with and the faster I can have a conversation with them because your, your, your borrower interactions can be sped up. They can be improved. They, everything can be improved. The amount of trust in a conversation can be improved. Um, you know, the speed with which you get a, a loan approved can be improved. Everything can be improved. And so then, then it gets it- down to... Yeah, isn't it great that it just by thinking that way, the abundance that you create, even just sort of um, when I'm thinking about that in in terms of all areas of my life and in the people that I'm coaching, it just, you know, when you think everything can be improved, the amount of abundance, that amount of energy that that it gives you is is super powerful. And that, that, that question that you said in terms of, you know, and when people are looking at their to-do list, what is the best use of my time right now? You know, and, and that's such an important question 
for, for everyone to ask. Um, because well, yeah. yeah, and the interesting thing, Ross, is that if everything can be improved, it gets to your second question. So what would happen if you could improve the velocity of trust? Okay, well, what would happen if, if it would, in a normal world, if it would take you 30 minutes and a couple follow-up calls to get a loan, what would happen if you could accelerate trust so that that conversation could take place in 10 or 12 minutes and there would be no follow-up? What if you could convert the first time you have a conversation? What if trust? And so working on accelerating trust and working on improving trust is all about stop selling, stop talking, stop promoting, and start really, really rethinking the questions you ask to get people to realize that there's a different way to do this. So I'd say to, I'd say to a borrower, you know, most lenders are happy to quote you an interest rate and the costs of doing the loan. How we're different is we spend roughly 30 to 45 minutes up front because we know that this loan is a big part of your overall financial plan. And we could quote you a rate with the wrong product or we could coach, coach you the wrong product with a low rate, or we could design a product. We could design a mortgage for you. We could be in the architecting home loan solutions business to make sure that whatever we recommend is the right thing for you long and short term. And so it's just, it's, it's not making it that wordy, but just getting down to yeah, it most, lenders will, do, most yeah. lenders will do this, how we are different is, and that accelerates the conversion. So you do that, and then the big deal, I think, I think the big deal, Ross, is you can't improve if you don't embrace failure. You just can't. It, you just can't. And I think, you know, I think, I didn't even know you were going to ask about this, but I, I had this document out uh, today. <clears throat> it's a seven-page document, and I was preparing for an interview that I did with a, a magazine here. And on the first page, there's 12 entries. And let me just read this. Fail, 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 succeed. And then I go to the second page, and it is fail, 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 success, fail, 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 fail. And then I wrote asshole because somebody was not being very friendly to me. Fail, success, 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 fail, fail, fail success 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 i mean i just put it up there it just it says it, it says it right there fail fail yeah, fail, yeah. fail 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 and so here's the deal um hot and cold right there's no such thing as hot without cold there's no, no such thing as cold without hot light dark light doesn't have any definition if dark doesn't exist and dark doesn't have a definition if light doesn't exist people need to understand success and failure are like that. Success and failure are the fabric of winning. And you can no longer think that you would have success without failing, then you can assume you're gonna fail without trying to achieve success. They're completely linked. And so there's two things on failure. One is avoid the failures that are avoidable. How do you do that? You get plugged into coaching, you get plugged into a system, you get plugged into a a business modality, a way of doing business. Because I don't want to fail if 1,132 people proved this is the wrong way to do it. I don't want to go down that and be the 1,133rd person, right? So you go to you go to work on other people's experiences. That's why mentoring is so important. That's why um, having a success coach is so important. That's why you know, investing in yourself and going to conferences and being part of learnings and, and podcasts. I mean, the, the more you learn on somebody else's dime, the less you're going to fail on your own. So that's one way, right? The other way is to understand that the only greatness you and I ever have as human beings is when we, when we get past that last ugly failure. So I use an example of becoming a private pilot. You know, when you, when you learn how to fly an airplane, um, there's, there's some key, key thoughts there, right? So one would be, you know, how do I fly and take off and do all that kind of stuff? But probably the more important thing is how do I land? You know, I mean, at some point, every pilot has to be really good at landing, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not good at landing, then nothing else matters. If you can't bring the plane down. And when you first try to land, just like the first time you make a sales call, it feels super foreign. It's just like, I've never done this before. This is ugly. I mean, good thing I have an instructor next to me, a coach, right? 
to help me kind of, and, uh, and I had days where, you know, trying to figure out a land. I mean, I, they were near death experiences and I may have died if I had not had a pilot instructor next to me, but 67 landings later, I got certified that I knew how to learn to land an airplane. And every single time, if I had gotten like, oh man, I almost crashed. That was horrible. I'm never going to be good at landing. Oh man, why did I even decide to become a pilot in the first place? If that's the conversation, you are not going to ever, ever be great. But if you can say, you know, that was an interesting crosswind and I didn't set the plane up the right way. And, and that crosswind is going to be able to be a tool to me. And if I know that, you know, the, the radar data is telling me I've got a 12 knot crosswind, I've got to adjust the plane. And so it's all a learning. And then you go, now I know how to land and I'm not putting anybody at risk. And that's the key. I don't think people, I don't think people have a healthy attitude towards the gift that failure provides. And if we did, then we'd say, bring it on, bring it on. I want to get it done. I want to eat it for breakfast. I want to get it out of the way because everybody else gives up when they're failing and I am not going to give up. I'm going to go up and I'm going to get All better. Right. So, well, let's, let's talk about some of your ones, right? This is about you. This is a podcast about you. So let's talk about some of, you know, the, the, the failures that you've had and sort of how that has sort of, you know, led you, led you to where you are today. <clears throat> Yeah, I'll give you uh, I'll give you a really early failure, and this was the this was a failure that probably cost me a million dollars, and it was while I was a broker. Um, I was having uh, a conversation with one of our developers, and there was a couple of loans that were going along, and they weren't going very very well. And so this developer got on the phone with me and started blasting me, just I mean, just really putting me in the penalty box and blah 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 blah. And I wasn't smart enough and I hadn't had enough experience yet to realize that how I handled this would determine the future of that relationship. So what I did is I engaged and I talked louder, I talked faster, I made him bad and wrong. You know, it doesn't matter, but he was making me bad and wrong, so I was making him bad and wrong. And um, at the end of the conversation, um, I hear him say, um, okay, hey, Todd, you win, and he hung up the phone. And I'm thinking, we won. Three days later, I go to walk into that office to have a meeting with all the pro properties that we're financing for this office. And the gal at the front said, based on your conversation with Richard, you're no longer allowed to work with this brand. And I got cut off. I got cut off from a builder, a developer. And it, it was a million dollar, it was a million dollar fail. Easy, just like that. And so you sit here and you look at, okay, how many conversational failures do we have? Um, where do we not ask the right questions? That if we ask the right questions, people would say yes. Um, how many loans have we brought in that we know probably are not going to have a good chance of settling and settling beautifully? And we take them anyway. Um, you know, what are those failures type things? And then, and then you, you start to look at that and you start to go, okay, so, so, so what, are, what, what are the ways to avoid that? Well, the ways to avoid it are to embrace it. So now any failure is like curiosity. Instead of going to like blame and shame and I blew it, I now go to curiosity because curiosity creates the breakthroughs. And so when you, when you think about that and you think about why did that happen? You know, what could I have done that would have prevented that from happening? And what will I do so that it doesn't happen again? I'll give you another massive failure. So this list of 12 pages is a season in my life where I, I was 45 years old. I was retired effectively. I, I had everything I needed and I was done. But I wasn't done because I'm still a dreamer. I'm still a visionary guy. And so what I decided to do when I didn't have to do anything is I decided to buy the biggest leadership company in America. And so my company went from 25 employees to 300 employees. And I bought a company seven states away from where you know, I was physically located. And I made two mistakes. You know, I, I, and, and I'm not a seasoned M&A guy. I'm not a mergers and acquisitions investor. I don't have a hedge fund. I just, 
I've wanted to buy the leadership company because we teach selling and it seemed like leadership and selling go hand in hand. I buy the company. We're six months into it. They need a million dollars. Um, we're 18 months into it. They need another $2 million and putting capital in, putting capital in, putting capital in. And the problem was I had the wrong guy leading the company. I had the wrong guy. He was a great guy, but he's a small company CEO. He's not a growth CEO. And I just assumed that a CEO is a CEO. So I left him in charge and that was a problem. And the second problem is I didn't have tight enough financial controls. The largest of which is um, I had a CFO that I didn't have a relationship with. It was the CFO for the company I bought. And what I didn't know is that he behind the scenes was paying out money, taking money, blah, 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 and hiding, right? So I'm two years into this thing. And Ross, I've probably, it's probably cost me $9 million. And that's a lot, that's a lot of money. And my marriage was strained. And so I figured I would, I would sell that company. And, uh, and I sold that company in, a, in an asset sale because you, you can't sell it if it's not making any money. So I, I had to take the risk, take the liabilities, but I got rid of the company. And then I, I said, you know what? My company still has value. The GFC uh, has not hit yet. I'm maybe going to sell my company. And so then I sell my company before the GFC hits. And then after the GFC hits, my wife comes down with terminal cancer and the guys that did the deal with me came in and I had to be on the road 60 days speaking. It was December 22nd. There's only eight days left in the year, nine days left in the year. And they were going to modify my deal um, or fire me for missing six days of work. And the only reason I didn't do those six days is because my wife was dying. So I got fired and from my own company and they enforced the non-compete and you're going, okay. And you go, what's good about this? You know, I mean, what, what, what is, what's the lesson learned here? And there's a whole bunch of lessons, right? I mean, you can, you can see them, they're just stacked up. But the key was my wife is gonna die. And uh, I'm a dad of a 13 year old boy and 11 year old boy. And uh, I gotta protect them at all costs. And I'm a financial guy and I've got mortgages, I got investment property, I gotta try and keep everything going. And there was a moment in time where my youngest son met me in the hallway, I was crying and he said, dad, you gotta do what you teach everybody to do. And I said, I said, what? And he said, you've got to keep going. That's the only way out of this. That's my 13 year old who's now 23. And he said, that, he said, that's the only way we can get out of this. And so we kept going and we kept going. I filed a wrongful termination lawsuit. I went big with attorneys. You know, I was going to, I was going to take them down. And seven months later, I got everything back. I got my money back. I got, you know, and, uh, and in that midst though, I had lost nearly everything. And I lost my wife of 25 years to cancer. And so, you know, you sit here and you go, so what really is good about that? And I didn't know the answer, Ross, till three or four years later, because I got a call from Success Magazine and they had a, uh, they had an issue called the big fat failure issue. That was the code word. They wanted to do an issue on failure. And Darren Hardy asked me if I would share my story. And it's the first time I'd ever become vulnerable to share that story to, you know, to, I mean, you're a success guy, you run a yeah. success company and that must, yeah, I can imagine you know, the amount of courage that took is, right? you know, compared to lots of things that you've done in business, but that step to share that vulnerable story, I can imagine. Well, here's, huge. here's what happened yeah. though. This is, this is, this is crazy. So we do the interview and it's published in the magazine and online. And I got a call 90 days after the publishing of that issue that that interview was the most downloaded interview that Success Magazine had. And it went on to become one of the top interviews for entrepreneurs all over the world on how to handle failure. So you sit here and you go, I'm going through the season, right? Failure never lasts unless you quit. That, that's the big thing you got to understand. Failure Love never that. lasts Love unless that. you quit. Yeah. And then, and then it's like, okay, I'm going to tell my story because there's a chance that I could impact millions of people around the world and make it okay for them to fail, fail and not, you know, not feel shame and not feel guilt and not feel woe is me and, and not have an identity crisis because they've lost, you know, a big piece of who they are. It's like, 
that's life. And the only time you're safe and the only time you're not going to fail is if you're not moving and you're not growing and you don't have vision. And if you're, if that is you, then that is you. And, and that is the life you're going to have. But if you have vision and you want to, you want to be your best version of you and you want to, you want to make a difference and, and make an impact and, and create financial freedom and, and do the things that you have the capability, the opportunity and the giftedness to do, you got to get flat out hungry for failure. You got to love it. I mean, there's a magazine out right now called the, the, uh, the guide to getting rich. And they look at everybody from Jeff Bezos to Warren Buffett to all these international guys, you know, Branson and all these guys. If you read the failure stories on these guys, it would inspire you like you have never been inspired. And you know what? Love it. Love failure. Don't do it if you can avoid it. Don't do it if strategy can eliminate it. But don't avoid it because failure is the greatest teacher there is as long as you learn the lesson and then don't repeat it. So what effect did that have on you like mentally at that point? Do were you, you know, obviously you're crying in the hallway when you, you, your son came in. So, I mean, how long did it get you, you know, did it get you down for? How long did you, and what did it take to sort of get you back? Um, yeah, so, so, yeah, I think, I think the things that I, that I would say to that, you know, as I kind of relive it is, um, the, the one thing that I will tell you, um, unequivocally that got me through it is I never lost sight of my purpose and my purpose since the age of 24, when I went through a life mastery exercise early on in my brokering career, my purpose was to make a difference. And it started off making a difference in a homeowner's life. And then, it start, and then it went to making a difference in a, a real estate agent's life. And then it went to making a difference in my team's life. And then, and so the, the one thing that kept me going is just because I'm down doesn't mean I'm done. That's very important people understand. Just because I'm down, it doesn't mean I'm done. And I, and I just, I kept things going because I had to with my boys, right? Um, I was a source of income and, and, uh, and, and, I, and I had to. Um, but purpose is what got me going. And then it's like, okay, I need a victory. I need a victory. Like a victory for me in the airplane example is when I go from not feeling good about landing to having one of those landings that feels like you're landing on a cloud. When you have a victory, it's let's go do it again. Like you play golf, you know, and probably 70% of your golf shots are less than best and 20% are good. And all it takes is that one shot on the 18th hole to bring you back from an otherwise crappy game, right? Because you know that the victory tells you, you got it and you can do it. So I think victory is important. For, for my, my wife, you know, I, I started celebrating uh, two things. I started celebrating half of my life, you know, half of my life I spent with a beautiful woman and she gave me two beautiful kids. And um, the, the greatest gift that she gave me, Ross, was a day before she slipped into a coma, she had me and both my boys on the bed and she was talking to us and she said to my boys, she said, I just want you guys to know that your dad is probably gonna date again, he's probably gonna go out again and he might even get married again. And I want you guys to know that if that happens, um, he has my blessing and I want you to know that as your mom and as his wife and a day later, she's in a coma and six days later, she's gone. And that was a gift that kept me going. That was a gift that brought love back into my life. It was a gift that gave me permission to, to continue growing and, and living my life. It's, it's, you know, sad as it is because nobody's life deserves to be snuffed out, especially when you're only 49 years old. Um, there were some real victories in there and some real legacy that, that she left. Um, but here's the deal. I think at the end of the day, I was doing a deal the other day with FBAA and talking with Peter White and we we're doing a little broadcast on wellness and, and health, mental health and stuff like that. And, uh, and I think one of the things that's interesting is, is that um, as entrepreneurs, as business people, you, you have to hold on to being hopeful. I mean, you know, if you're not hopeful and you hope less or you're hopeless, 
everything turns, everything turns. And, and I was hopeful. I was hopeful that my career would continue. I was hopeful that I could continue to make a, an impact in people's lives. And I got to a point where I said, you know what? Um, based on everything I've learned, I could do three or four times the business and impact in the next 10 years than I did in the first uh, 18 years. And, uh, and that's exactly what's happened. And so there's good to everything. We, we, we talk about silver lining living, right? And yeah. everything, think, everything that goes yeah. wrong is a gift. Everything that goes wrong teaches you something if you're curious. <laughs> Definitely. And I, you know, I love that in terms of what you're saying. And I think what it comes down to is, you know, the focus on others in terms of your focus around making a difference to others yeah. takes that focus away from the self Oh, the poor me, yep. you know, the poor me. And, um, it's around that service to others and, you know, which shifts you, um, you know, from that, and it's you, you talked about core reluctance, right? And because core reluctance is is something from yourself. Whereas, as you said before, if you focus on adding value to other people when you're picking up the phone, it changes the game. There's none. Mm-hmm. There's none of that core reluctance. So, mm-hmm. I think even you know that that focus on self, the way to sort of make you hopeful is to to focus on, as you said, your biggest purpose which is to make a difference and if you were to expand that and make a difference you're making a difference too yeah i'm people, making it right yeah you're making it, you're making you're you're an agent of life change when you really understand the value kind of game um you got to get to a point where you where you take a look at how can i best serve people and my motive is I'm not serving to gain, I'm serving to give. And you have to understand that there's this natural law of reciprocity, which is that if I, if I give you value with no expectations, and I do that for an extended period of time, and you start to realize that I'm not even doing business with Ross and look at what he's doing in my life, or I'm not even doing business with Todd and look at what he's doing in my life. Pretty soon, whoever your provider is that isn't doing that is off the radar. It comes straight back to you. And now all of a sudden the conversation is easy, but I think it's important to understand you can't just wholesale this. You can't just say, I'm just going to give, 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 give. There's got to be, um, a methodology about around who you're giving to. You got to be really, really clear that there's an odds on chance that if you guys come together to do business, that you'll have chemistry, which is two people wanting to do business together and liking each other. There's a, there's a, there's a good chance if you have chemistry, you'll have deeper conversation, which always leads to faster trust, higher trust and more secure trust. And if you have a deeper conversation, you'll idea, you'll come up with ideas and you'll have ideation going on. So you gotta, you gotta collaborate on those ideas. And then if you're both thinking like the sky is not even the limit, then you're going to have a little bit of conflict because I might want to go this way with you and you may want to go this way with me. And so we just got to resolve that conflict and decide which way are we going? And as soon as you do that, then you have a connected relationship. And I had, I had one real estate agent that in four years gave me um, $80 million in closed loans with an average loan amount of $71,000. And it took two years of giving her value in the, in the form of, here's how I can help you as an agent. Here's some of the things that top producing agents do. Here's some of the things that, that world-class business owners do. You know, it was just, it was that kind of value. And two years later, it just, boom. The guy I'm giving loans to doesn't do anything. He's taking me for granted. The guy I'm not giving loans to is blessing my life every single week. I'm calling Todd. And that's all it took. And it was like, boom. And exactly. I think far too often we, 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 we make calls thinking about getting instead of talking to people about giving. And ancient scripture says that the generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. So there's no, I mean, it's just, it's just Some awesome. Stuff. Because there's no fear. There's no fear. Yeah. Something that, you know, just touched me to what you're saying there is, 
you know, you can't, and someone said to me the other day, you can't be shallow and to be deep at the same time, right? Yeah. So by doing just all those little things, that's sort of just getting you down, 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 down. So you have a deep relationship with someone. And when you have that deeper relationship, then that's where the trust is and that's where, you know, the level of value and it's going to, you know, put those deposits in their emotional bank account. So they won't think about going anywhere else, will they? Because you've added so much value and you've got such a more deeper and profound level. So I think, you know, that's a great message. I think well, people- I want to uh, start to wrap it up because we're sort of running out of time. But, you know, you've Darn. They worked <laughs> with five, you know, we've worked with about five million uh, students over your career and you've worked with, you know, some of the, the, the best and, and, and top producers uh, in the States. And the thing that I love about your market is, you know, everyone needs to sell to continue to make a living. Like in Australia, we get a lot of complacency because brokers have that ongoing trailing commission and there's a level of complacency around sales. And that's why I love studying your market, you know, listening to, to yourself um, because there's such a focus on sales. So what, um, yeah, what are some of the things to be great at sales? Because I know that's a, a passion of yours. What, what are some of the tips that you would give to the brokers here around how they can be great at sales What from what you've seen from your elite performance? So there are a couple of things come to mind. One um, is move from um, on-demand to in-demand. And, and what that requires is not relying on your availability to do business, but rely on your advice to do business. And so that's a big shift because when you're in the advice business, you're not in the selling business. So in order to be in the advice business and the mortgage business, you just got to be a, a master practitioner. You got to understand the markets. You've got to understand you know, the global impact, you got to understand your, you know, your um, Royal Commission regulation and all the other state regulations that are going on, just like we do here. And you got to be, you got to be really good. You know, you got to, you got to know your trade. And the, the biggest thing that removes the need to sell is when people call you because of your reputation. And, and, and then there is no selling. So that then requires a shift in thinking about, Every single borrower that you sit down with for the rest of your life, you have no idea the pathway that they could create for you to be engaged into an, uh, another social tribe of 10 or 100 or 1,000 people, right? And so you, you want to you do that so that it unleashes this deep level of trust. Advice is more important than anything, uh, particularly with the largest debt that most people will ever carry. So that's number one. Number two is redesign your questions. You know, one of the things that, that, that we know top producers do is they um, don't get into this rote checklist of questions. They, they have a deep desire to connect with a potential client. And once they are a client, to continue that connection. So we're telling people, sit down and, and, and think about the questions you're asking. Like, um, I just had an interview before this with James Clear, who's the author of the book, Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits. And he'll be yeah. At, yeah. yeah. And he'll be at it's sales. It's a great book. Yeah. It's yeah. Great book. And he'll be at sales mastery this year. And, um, you know, he and I have never talked and I wanted to make sure that we connected really fast. So Ross, I just opened this doc. The first question I asked him, as I said, what do you get most excited about when you talk about habits? And all I had to do was ask that question. It was in his lane and he talked for five to seven minutes and we kind of outlined his speech by asking one question. I think too many brokers think that asking questions is, and the more the merrier, that's not true. The, 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 the fewer that are deeper. So ask the questions you have never asked so you can learn the things you've never learned, so you can solve the things you've never solved. If you do that, you'll never have to sell a day in your life. And then the last piece, massive, massive gratitude. 
in the States, there is no such thing as a trailing commission. They get a little bit more upfront, but they have every bit the economic opportunity to do a loan for a refinance or to do a loan for an investment property or to nurture that database and nurture that client base. But if you don't follow up, you know, somebody told me early on, he said, you know, if you want your clients for life, you need to talk to them during their life. Mm -hmm. And most people here in the States are horrible at nurturing that database. And I don't believe that in Australia, if you didn't have trail, that, um, you know, that it would, uh, it would be any different. And I know it's not in Canada and I know it's not in some of the other uh, uh, UK, UK countries that have mortgage finance. It, it truly really is about if, if I value you, then I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to call you. I have a guy right now that's going to be at mastery. He's closed 128 mil year to date. And he has referred almost a million dollars in commissions back to real estate agents through July, a million dollars. And 80% of his client consultations are from his database and he's leveraging those. He's averaging 10 to 11 mortgage reviews a day, 15 minutes. And then he's referring to people that are buying back to the agents. And now the agents are lining up to see if they can get into relationship with him because the word on the street is if you work with Wally, you get commission referrals. So it's just stop selling, stop promoting, start connecting, go deep, ask questions that show you care, be smart, learn the business, be in the advice business and, 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 and pick a discipline. I mean, pick a discipline and you do those things. You never have to sell a day in your life. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Yeah. It's, you know, particularly those questions and particularly, I know when we were talking about your businesses and I was sort of getting some tips for, for starting my business. And that was one of the key things that you said is that you do in your business is you continually mine and, and go through your database and make sure you know, that that data is rich and you're adding as much value as you possibly can to the to the right people. And, you know, for the successful brokers here, the people that really nurture and look after their existing clients and take into account their full position, not just the transaction of that loan, but how can I add value to their life? They're the ones that are going to take that next level of success. So, Todd, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Really, um, as always, you know, when you and I start chatting, it just goes to, to somewhere great and it definitely has today. Um, and there's, you know, been so much value um, for, for everyone and the brokers and, you know, the lessons that you've shared and the ups and downs that somebody like yourself, but, you know, as you said to me, you're not slowing down. You know, you've, you've got an event. Um, do you want to just, yeah, just give your event uh, a bit of a plug? Um, oh, sure. So got, yeah, 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 yeah. So we've been in the event business since I started the company and uh, one of our, our big event every year has been called Sales Master. We've had about 140,000 mortgage brokers go through that. It's usually a live audience of a couple thousand, uh, maybe 3,000 people. And with COVID, um, we had to make a, a, a pretty radical pivot. And so what we decided to do is we decided to convert the entire event into a 4K live digital experience. So part of it is live streaming, part of it is live on the stage, and part of it is uh, live digital. The, the, the beautiful thing about making the conversion, we have 44 contributors, 44 best-selling authors in the world, 44 top producing brokers and real estate agents. And we have 17 wealth managers from three or four of the largest uh, financial houses in the world. And all we're going to do for three days is deliver content in 20 minute to 30 minute sound bites. And you can access it from all over the world, front row seats. You don't have to fly here. You don't have to do any of that. So, um, so it's September 16th, 17th, and 18th. If you go to salesmasteryevent.com, there is a $100 US discount going on right now from a $399 ticket to $299. And that is good through the end of August. And um, there are over 50,000 people signed up around the world for this event. Amazing, and, and amazing. Ross, you talk about how do you turn lemons into lemonade? 
COVID, nobody can fly, we can't hold an event. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that you could have a blessing of, of speaking to 40% of the audience that took you 28 years to speak to? Yeah, unbelievable. Pretty big deal. Uh, so yeah, everybody just yeah. go there, salesmasteryevent.com, and uh, you'll see the discount, the agendas there, every, everything's signed up. And if you, I guess, we could even say that um, if they want another 10% discount off of that, if they're an FDAA member, then they can go through FDAA and they've got a discount too. Beautiful. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, for the value for that to hear someone from someone like Todd. And as I say, the, the American market is great to study because they are so sales focused and, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, so definitely get on that. This has uh, been another episode of the Billion Dollar Broker podcast. Um, with Ross LeCain. Thanks very much. Cheers, guys. If you want to subscribe, we're on Apple, Spotify, SoundCloud, or where you get your podcasts. We also have a group uh, called the Billion Dollar Broker Group on Facebook. Uh, request to join and uh, we'll be sharing this and so many different resources uh, and creating a real community. So please join. Uh, and if you're interested in my services, whether you want to be coached, uh, please get in contact. I'd love to hear from you. All right. Thanks again. See you next time.